something and the pieces get taken care of. It's like Cameron maybe trying to build something with Legos that he really loves to do and all of a sudden, you know, Josiah comes along and as soon as Cameron puts a piece on the Legos, Josiah takes it off and goes somewhere and pretty soon he's frustrated, I'm trying to build something and the pieces keep disappearing. That's what happens in the church. People keep running off and, and trying to do uh, their own thing. My, 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 my. Look at, well, don't, you don't need to look up Hebrews 10, 25. I already told you about it. Let us not give up meeting together. Togetherness is part of it. Now, turn to Ruth chapter 1. You say, Pastor, that's a jump. Yes, I know. Ruth chapter 1. By the way, the book of Ruth in Shavuot, the tradition is you read the entire book of Ruth. So we'll do that on Erev Shavuot. Standing up, I, you know, that's an idea. You know the story of Ruth. You know that, that Naomi and her husband went to live in a different land because there was famine uh, in the land. They went to live somewhere else and then Naomi's husband died. She had two sons. They married Moabite women from the tribe of Moab. Uh, by the way, they shouldn't have been doing that. But they, they married these two Moabitess. And then what happened is the, the two men died. And so now we have Naomi and her two daughters. Okay? And Naomi says, I, I'm hearing that back in Israel, everything's fine now. There's, there's blessing in the land. So she tells her two daughters, I'm going to go back to Israel. I'm going to go back to the homeland to live. And you two, you can stay here. Because, I mean, you know... You go back to your people, and I'm going to go back to my people. We, we, we know the story. And one of the daughters-in-law says, I'm, I'm going to do that. But Ruth makes a different decision. And so in verse 15, chapter 1, Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But, oh man, there's a lot around the word but, isn't there? <laughs> verse 16, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. That is a complete sellout. That is, that I'm, I'm going to, your people are going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. I'm going to live wherever you live. In fact, I'm going to die where you die. I will be buried where you are buried. My, 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 my. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. What was she doing? She was entering through a door into a household. I'm not coming in the door and saying, my God will still be my God, but I want to be with you. She's not entering through a door saying, I, I, I really love the fellowship of you, Naomi, but when I end here, I want you to know I'm going to stay connected to my people. Come on. Here, here, here's, here's the people of Moab. And she's told, go live with your people. And she says, no, I'm going to draw a line. I'm going to enter the door of Israel. When I, when I enter the door of Israel, I have shut the door to the people of Moab. If you don't shut the door to the people of Moab, you've not entered into the household of Israel. You can't have both. You can't say, I want to be in here, but I want a fellowship with here. Because everyone in here has no fellowship with Moab, because Moab is the world, and this is a place of God. Hallelujah. In fact, the Israelis were forbidden to marry Moabites. This is the world, the people of Moab. This is... This is the family of God. And, and Naomi says, go back to, you're in the world, that's what you like, go live in the world. And one does, yes, but the other one says, no, I've seen something in you. I've seen a righteousness in you. I've seen a holiness in you. I've seen something about you, Naomi, that I want. I want it so much that the price I'm willing to pay is your people are now my people. These are not my people anymore. Come on, church, you got to get this. These are not my people anymore. Your people are my people. These gods are not my gods anymore. Your God is my God. 
I don't live where these people live. I don't think like these people. I'm not watching what they watch on TV. I am moving into this place, and I'm going to watch what you watch, think like you think, live like you live, talk like you talk, eat like you eat. I am not this anymore. I draw a line, and I enter into a household and become part of it. The result of that decision was that Ruth becomes a great-grandmother of David, who is in the line of Messiah. A woman of Moab gets into the genealogy of God's plan for history by doing what? By drawing a line and saying, I'm not of these people anymore, I'm of these people. My, my, my. Listen, what, what happens in the church is that we go out and we try to build an evangelism around, let's be all things to all people. So we may tell them that there's a door, may, maybe not, but we say to people, listen, just come in, bring Moab with you. That's not biblical. That's not biblical. Look, come and, be, come and be part of what God's doing, the family. Go ahead and bring your worldly music. Bring your worldly attitudes. Bring your worldly sin. Oh, Pastor, are you saying that, that God, you got to straighten up your life first? No, 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 no. You got to understand there's a price to pay to get in the house. We, we're living in an era of cheap grace. Say this prayer and you become a Christian. That is not biblical. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. Repent. That's right. Be baptized, be converted, turn your way of thinking, and then enter the house. If there's no repentance, then you haven't said, this is bad and this is good. I repent of this and enter into that. We try to enter in here and keep this. But Ruth said, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going here. Ruth, who are you? I'm of the people of Israel. I thought you were a Moabite. I was. You know, Ruth, who, how many gods you got? I got one, Yahweh. Yeah, but Ruth, we know, we knew you as a kid. I mean, you know, you had all these. No, 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 that was. I gave it up. You didn't keep any of it? R Ruth, what about your family and your relatives? You know, they have pagan feasts every once in a while, and they invite you back to the pagan feast. They're not my people anymore. These are my people. These are my people. My, 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 my. It is the cost of entering the household. It's a cost of entering the household. There's a cost. Say the word cost. Say cost. There's a cost to everything in life. By the way, there's a cost you're going to pay. There's a price you're going to pay if you stay in Moab. <laughs> yeah, there's a price to stay in Moab, but there's a price. Look at Matthew chapter 4. You still with me? Matthew chapter 4. Boy, if you can get this in your head and thinking, it'll set you free. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. As Yeshua was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Yeshua said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, say at once. They left their nets and followed him. Wait a minute, these were commercial fishermen. They left their business. That's right. There was a leaving in order to get into something. If you can't leave your nets, then you're not going to be a follower of Yeshua. Leave your nets and follow me. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're getting some speed up because we're coming near the end. <laughs> Matthew 9, Matthew 9, verse 9. As Yeshua went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Excuse me, Matthew, that's your job. What's Mrs. Matthew going to do? <laughs> Matthew got up from his job. See, quit there. We... Bible story. No, this isn't a Bible story. 
Matthew is a tax collector. He's in the middle of work, and Yeshua walks up and says, if you want life, if you really want what's worthwhile, follow me. And he made a decision. He got up and walked away from it. It's over. He's no longer Matthew the tax collector. He's now Matthew the Talmudin, the disciple. My, 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 my. Look at Matthew uh, ni uh, chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Yeshua didn't say, keep your job, come follow me. <laughs> We're talking about leaving in order to enter into something. Matthew chapter 19, let's jump down to, uh, well, let's pick verse 16. Now a man came up to Yeshua and asked him, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Yeshua replied, There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Yeshua replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man asked. What do I still lack? Yeshua answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. You want to follow me? Go home, get rid of all that stuff, and then come follow me. When's the last time you've heard of someone inviting someone and saying, Look, you want to be a follower of Jesus? That's really great. I've witnessed I really want to be a follower of Jesus. Great, I'm going to come home with you. And we're going to go through your room and we're going to get rid of all the trash. I'm going to go through your record collection, your CD collection. I'm going to go through your magazine collection. I'm going to go through your books, and I'm going to say, look, you want to be a follower? you got to get rid of this junk. You can't be coming to church, and you're reading that trash at home. I'm going to get rid of it. We're going to have a house-cleaning party, and then you can come follow. We make the requirements non-existent, and therefore we get non-existent faith. We don't put a demand on anybody. But that's not Bible. Excuse me, you want to follow? There's a price to pay. Glory to God. I took a group, a youth group years ago up to uh, New Hampshire for a winter retreat. I was running a coffee house, a drop-in. And so I said, I'm going to do a retreat with these kids. 99% of them were not Christians. This was new to me. You know, I'm, I'm in a group of pagan kids. I'm going to take them away to a retreat center. <laughs> You know, in fact, I'm, I'm doing it with another Christian group. That turned out to be interesting in and all of itself, mixing those two together. But I stood up and, and I said, listen, there's so, several rules. You know, when you come with me, you're on my territory. There'll be no marijuana, there'll be no drugs. Drugs weren't the issue, marijuana was. There'll be no drinking whatsoever. If I so much as find a bottle, I'm going to pack all of you up and you're going home. Yeah, we understand, Pastor, we understand. So I take this group of pagan kids. We get that we're not there half an hour. And I find a bottle. I gather them all together and say, you've got 20 minutes to pack all your bags, you're going home. I mean, it got real still. You know, and they said, is there anything we can do? I said, no. <laughs> Now, the guy that was working with me was a Christian, and, and just freshly out of the hippie movement. I mean, this guy looked like Arlo Guthrie, you know, and he was a good friend of mine, and, uh, and he came over to me and says, um, can, can, can you give me 20 minutes with him before, before that? And I said, okay, you got 20 minutes. Man, I'll tell you, he went up one side of him, down the other side of him, about what they had done to their best. He said, this is my best friend, pastor's my best friend, and look what you did, and blah, blah, blah. And by the time he finished, they were crying. He had teenagers crying. And he said, I'm going to intercede for you. What was he playing? He was playing the role of the high priest. I'm God, you're the people, boom, you know. <laughs> and he gets to be the high priest, you know. And he comes in and he says, I, I know what you said, and I know it's the law, and I know it's the right thing to do. But they never in their life have ever encountered a limit. They, they've never, you know, they're used to parents saying, don't do it, and they do it and get away with it. They've never met anyone who says, this is a word, and um, they've just never met that. And he said, they have promised that it, they will search through if any of the others have anything at all, they'll bring it. And I got them all, they will personally come to you privately and ask your forgiveness. Would you give them another chance? I didn't want to. 
Good thing I'm not God, huh? <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not God. I didn't want to give him another chance. You know, and I said, okay, that's it. One chance. You know, and so he carries the news back, and all of a sudden he comes up to me about 20 minutes later, and it turns out there was four or five bottles that had been brought in, and they're all there. We poured them all out. And, you know, and through the rest of that evening, it was amazing. I'd be walking out, and somebody come up and say, Pastor, would you please forgive me? Tears in their eyes, even the guys, tears in their eyes, we're sorry. We had a great weekend. Why? <laughs> because if you're going to enter in, there's a price. And someone stood up in their life and said, there's a price. If you want life, there's a price for it. Amen? The rich young ruler, what am I going to do? You've got to go home, sell everything you have, give it away. Why? Because money was his God. And, and Yeshua just basically said, that's it. Now, what did the young man do? You know the story. He turned away sad. Yeshua didn't go and say, well, let's talk about it. Uh, maybe give half of it away. Uh, maybe that's too much at once. Why don't you give 10% this year and another 10%? Why don't you just give up your extra house, not your house? Like, no, no, no. Yeshua walked away. Why? If you're not willing to pay the price, if you can't leave Moab, if you're not ready to say, your people, Yeshua, will be my people. Your God's going to be my God. Wherever you choose to live, I will live there with you. Where you die, I'm going to die, and I'll be buried where you're buried. Total commitment. My, 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 my. You still with me? All right, he gets more interesting. Luke chapter 9. A couple more of these and we'll be done. Luke chapter 9. You still with me? Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Remember what we're talking We're talking about making a decision that if you want to get in the house, you've got to leave something. If you're not prepared to leave, you haven't left. You're straddling a fence. That's a terrible place to be. You know why? Because if you straddle the fence, you're not in here enough to get life. But the people back here you're trying to co compromise and please, they're not pleased anyway. Watch this. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Yeshua replied, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Yeshua said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Yeshua replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I call these difficult sayings of Yeshua. There's a moed. The moed is coming up. We must be a voice for Israel. Well, somebody died. You make a choice. Oh, pastor, really? Yes, really. In the grand scheme of things, is your presence at the funeral more important than being a voice for Israel? You read your Bible and tell me the answer. Because I've got scripture. 